Would you join me in prayer? Oh, Lord God, I need you. We need you. You've hardwired us to worship you, to follow you. And we desire this evening, Lord, that you speak to our hearts, that you renew our souls, that you bring resurgence into each of our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a few moments ago on the floor, I started doing a little math. I asked myself, Lord, how many sermons have I preached in the last 35 years? And a conservative estimate as I lay there on the floor was well over 2,000. Now, when you've preached that many sermons, it's easy to you know, forget what led to each of them. But there are some, especially in the last few years, that have stuck in my mind, and they will remain there as long as my mind works, I believe. One of them is a little over three years ago. I was getting ready to preach on a subject that I've preached on I don't know how many times, well over 30, because you always preach on Jesus the Good Shepherd on Good Shepherd Sunday. Isn't that correct, Pastor Mark? Especially when you come from a conservative Lutheran background. You just, you have to do that. And I still remember, I don't know, 30 years ago, reading a classic, a devotional classic by Philip Keller, entitled The Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. And it was a book that greatly impacted me. I'm a city boy. Any other city people here? How many of you grew up in this city? Yeah, quite a few of us. I'm a city boy. You know, I, I don't know. I, I married a girl from the farm. And uh, I, I still remember the first time I got to meet Jan's folks, and then we were in college together, and Jan's dad would actually come over every Friday night after work, and uh, he would pick us up, take us over to Wisconsin. We would spend uh, the weekend with Jan's folks. We'd go to church together. We'd eat together. It was a great way for me to get to know them and for them to see, you know, who is this guy that their daughters brought home. <laughs> Uh, but Jan's dad put me to work. He taught me how to drive a tractor. And so I learned how to, to shift seven, seven, seven gears forward, three gears in reverse. He also recognized that I had quite a bit of training. You know, I'd, I'd been taking uh, Greek and Latin and German, and I was going to be studying Hebrew. And so one of the first things he did was recognizing that, that great wealth of experience he, he had me do something that I was equipped to do, and that was go out and shovel the barn. <laughs> and that is not a joke. That's why I, I shoveled that whole barn, and I, I learned a lot through my father-in-law. And this city boy, you know, gradually began to understand a little bit more about the farm. Although I still remember the time, honey, when uh, we were sitting in the kitchen with your folks, and uh, I, I made a comment, look at that tractor driving down the street. Well, they don't have streets out in, in, you know, in the country. They're, they're, those are called roads, I was told. And they got a great deal of joy out of, out of my lack of knowledge. But over the years, I've learned more and more about farms and livestock. And after I read Philip Keller's book, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, I thought I really knew quite a bit about sheep. And so three years ago, I was getting ready to preach on Jesus the Good Shepherd and us the sheep. And I was getting ready to say how dumb sheep are because that's what I'd read in the book. And I'd heard it from others. They told me, you know, people that I knew, they said they grew up on the farm and they had sheep and they're dumb as posts. And so that's what I was getting ready to preach on. And I was going to be talking about how dumb we are and how good the shepherd is. And it, it made a lot of sense. And I got it out of a book and I'd heard it from others. And then just all of a sudden, there's this overwhelming sense inside, and I've learned to listen to that because that's the Holy Spirit talking. He said, you need to go and look at some sheep. <laughs> and so I did. Because not too far from the, the airport, there's actually a working farm that has sheep. And so I drove over there. I took a look at the sheep. I got out of my car. I walked up close to the fence. The sheep came over. And there was this one little guy who looked at me, and you know what? He 
he didn't look that dumb. <laughs> I mean, seriously, looking in the eyes of that sheep, I felt like he was watching me and kind of checking me out. And all of a sudden, there's this sense inside, that still small voice that says, Google sheep intelligence. And so I went back to the office. Googled sheep intelligence, and I was in awe of God through what I read. Because you see, the first thing that came up when I Googled sheep intelligence at the very top of the list was a brand new study that had just been done by scientists in the UK over in England. They had been studying sheep intelligence, and they discovered something that was radically new. They found out that sheep are far smarter than we ever thought. They discovered something else. Sheep are among the brightest of livestock. Now that's against everything that I'd been told and everything that I'd read. They said the average sheep can memorize 60 human faces and recognize 60 human voices and discern one from another. And in response to the critics who were saying, well, sheep are dumb, they said, sheep don't function well unless they have a good shepherd. Because on their own, sheep really don't do well. But when they have a good shepherd, this is what the researchers discovered, sheep are incredibly productive they pick up on so much and they understand so much. And I was blown away by what I'd read because that article had appeared in the Times of London and The Guardian just a matter of a few weeks earlier. It changed my message that weekend. And since that time, God's taught me some other things about sheep. And I'd like to share them with you here tonight. You see, about two years ago, Jan and I were in Israel. And uh, we had gone out to Shepherd's Field. There were a number of people with us. But I walked out ahead of the group. And it was kind of a rough walk. And I decided I was just going to go way out into the field all by myself. I probably went somewhere close to, I don't know, a quarter of a mile. And uh, as I got further and further out into the field and, you know, kind of jumping around, I, 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 Pastor Mark, I just got to tell you, I, I love it when we clap, but I cannot clap to save my life. I have absolutely no rhythm. And when you talk, you know, I, I'm free to dance. Someday I pray that God gives me a rhythm transplant. <laughs> Because I am not free to dance. And Jan, Jan is a musician. And when, when we were courting, she brought out her metronome to try, try to teach me how, how to clap in time and so forth. I, I can't hear the beat in an ompa band. But I can jump. And, you know, the, the movie White Men Can't Jump, this white man can jump, but he cannot dance to save his life. But he has learned some things about sheep, and here's what God has taught me walking out in that field outside of Bethlehem, all by myself, all of a sudden out of the corner of my eye, I notice some movement. And I look over and I see a shepherd and his flock coming my direction. I stood still and I watched. They were hundreds of yards off and they ended up coming directly toward me. And the shepherd was leading the way for the sheep. Sheep were following behind him. As he drew near, we could see one another, and I held up my little little camera, little digital camera, and I pointed to it, and, you know, and I'd take a picture and just kind of smile. And as they kept coming closer, I listened to the shepherd. And the shepherd was making this very soft but distinctive kind of clicking noise. And the sheep were following directly behind him. And what came to mind, John chapter 10, where Jesus talks about himself as the shepherd, 
And he says, the shepherd goes ahead of him, of them, and the sheep follow him. And I thought, here I am watching this. And as the sheep got closer, they looked at me for one brief moment and paid hardly any attention. They walked past me on both sides. And as they walked past, they just kept following the sound of the shepherd's voice. And I thought, oh God, this is so good. I am not going to forget this. And so as a result, about a year ago, I was getting ready to introduce a missionary who had come to visit us. And I thought this would be a wonderful time to, to talk about the shepherd and the sheep. And so I got out some of those pictures that I had taken of the shepherd walking past and the sheep following. And I found some really great photos. And I thought this will be a perfect illustration just to introduce this missionary. It'll be short. It'll be sweet. And, and, and I can talk about how the sheep follow the shepherd. And I got to see that. And I put the pictures together. I had my remarks prepared. I went home. It was Thursday night. My day off began. I fell asleep, sleeping very comfortably when I'm suddenly awakened at 2.11 a.m. Remember it distinctly, and here's what woke me up. I heard, Chris, how do you separate sheep from goats? It was so out of the blue and so bizarre, but it spoke directly to my heart because the previous day, putting those pictures together, I found myself the city boy, you know, looking at these pictures of the sheep, but I thought, I think some of those are goats. I mean, some have got horns, and some of them have beards, and some of them are real hairy, and others are fleecy. And I thought, how do I know if this is, you know, a goat or just a hairy sheep? <laughs> and now, in the middle of the night, I'm awakened, how do you separate sheep from goats? And I, I actually spoke out loud and I said, that's a great question, Lord. I was just asking that yesterday in my office. And I sensed him saying, do goats hear the shepherd's voice? I thought, wow, that is a great question. I think I'll check that out when I wake up. <laughs> But you know what? I couldn't get back to sleep. And that question just continued to bounce around in my mind. And so, a little after two in the morning, on the morning of my day off, I got up and started researching sheep and goats. And I cannot believe what I found. I came away from that, and I will just tell you this. You know, Mark, we had great education. Went, went to wonderful seminary, went to tremendous education, learned Greek and Hebrew, Latin and German. I've read umpteen commentaries on sheep and goats, and Jesus is the good shepherd. I've read books and devotionals on it, but by the time I had spent two hours from about 2.15 until around 4.30 that Friday morning, I came away saying to myself, how could I have gone through all those years of schooling and have been a pastor for 34 years and not realized this? Why didn't somebody tell me? Here's what I learned. Here's what I've read, first of all. What I've read over the years is, when Jesus said he returns and he will separate sheep from goats just as a shepherd does, what I've read is, he's just using a figure of speech and it's a way of saying, you know, different types and so on and it's no big deal. That's basically what the commentaries that I have read have said. Jesus just sort of pulled that out of the air, and uh, he used that as a nice illustration. Do you really think our Savior just pulls stuff out of the air? <laughs> Unthinking, without any significance or real purpose or meaning? Uh-uh. 
Here's what I learned about sheep and goats. First of all, sheep and goats in most parts of the world are separated. They're raised separately. They're kept separate. There's only really one place in the world where they are really regularly mixed together. You want to guess where that is? Israel. Yeah. And they have been for centuries. Sheep and goats mingle together freely in that part of the Middle East. Most of the rest of the world, not true, I'm told. At least that's what I've now read or learned something else. Although they look a lot alike, and they're both clean animals, according to the Bible. Sheep and goats are totally different. Sheep have 54 chromosomes. Goats have 60. They are totally different animals. Even though in Israel they are often herded together, they also have very unique personalities. Sheep say, ba. Goats say, ma. Goat tails go up, sheep tails go down. Uh, some goats, most goats actually have horns, and some of them have beards. All of them have hair. Some sheep have hair, but no goats have fleece. But there's more. Even though in Israel they go together, they do things very differently. For instance, Sheep keep their young near them all the time. Their young are always near to their folks. Goats, on the other hand, well, young goats are called kids. And uh, goats allow their kids to hang around with other kids. And goats go off on their own, the adult goats. And the kids, they just stay together and they take care of themselves. Sheep stay with sheep. Goats, they raise themselves, but there's more. Sheep eat only things low to the ground. They especially like green grass, small plants. Goats will eat anything. They will try anything. In fact, goats thrive on garbage, but there's more. Sheep have absolutely no social structure. Did you know that? No hierarchy. Sheep are wired to live with other sheep and to follow a shepherd. That's the way the Creator has made them. If sheep are on their own, they die. If sheep are just with other sheep, they are, they are helpless before predators. Sheep need a shepherd, and they will not survive without it. But sheep have absolutely no ego. And sheep don't try to be the top sheep. You know, you may hear about the top dog, but you won't hear about the head sheep. <laughs> sheep simply follow the shepherd. Goats, they're a whole lot different. Goats establish their social structure by butting heads. Goats contest with one another to see who is going to be the top goat in this flock. Sheep are wired to follow a shepherd. Goats will follow a shepherd if there's nothing else to do. But goats will do whatever they darn well please when they feel like it. And the only time they will definitely come to the shepherd is if they feel like it or if the shepherd's got some food and they're tired of eating garbage. That's the difference between sheep and goats. Jesus says, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. They know my voice and they follow me. Sheep listen to the shepherd. Goats do what they darn well want to do when they want to do it. And the Bible says, Matthew chapter 25, when the Lord Jesus returns, He is going to separate the sheep from the goats. The difference between those who listen to His voice and those who will go wherever they want. The sheep follow the shepherd to the green pastures of His Word. The sheep follow the shepherd as He leads them to where the Spirit would take them. The goats go wherever they want. 
And the Bible says on the last day, he is going to separate the sheep from the goats. Even though they travel in the same flock. Because you see, it's possible to be part of the flock and not be a sheep. Do you realize how significant that is? It is possible to be a part of a flock and not be a sheep. And that, for me as a pastor, is absolutely overwhelming and scares the living daylights out of me. Because I've been an under-shepherd for many, many years. And I've known lots of people who are part of a flock. But I've also known many who don't seem to want to listen to the shepherd's voice, the good shepherd. Because there's a difference between sheep and goats. And I believe what God is telling us is what my kids used to sing when they were little. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. Because I want to follow the shepherd. Because the shepherd is the good shepherd. Jesus says, John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Do goats hear the shepherd's voice? When they feel like it. But sheep listen to his voice. And they follow him. And Jesus says, and I give them eternal life. Why would we want anything else? Why would we want to be anything else but a sheep? Because it's not about what your, uh, your heritage is. It's not about how much you have studied and gone to Sunday school. It's not about whether you can actually read the Bible in a language other than English. It's all about knowing the shepherd, the good shepherd, and following him. Because we are his sheep, and he cares for us. And he desires to lead us into those green pastures. He desires to take us where he longs for us to go so that we may know him as never before and follow him as never before. Today in Israel, when you go out into the wilderness area, to the east of Jerusalem, some of the most barren territory on the planet, you will see on many of the hillsides what appear to be lines drawn along the sides of the hill. Those lines have been there for hundreds, even thousands of years. They are paths that have been followed year after year in that very, very barren and dry wilderness. Paths that sheep have walked on over and over again through the centuries following their shepherd. And do you know what those paths are called? What the historic name for them is? Even if you don't know, I bet you'll recognize it. For centuries, going way back, probably for thousands of years, they've been referred to as paths of righteousness. The Lord is my shepherd, David wrote, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid because you're with me and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to be a sheep because he is the good shepherd. And I don't want to be a goat, because a goat may travel in the same circles, but a goat is living for his or her purposes, 
not for the shepherd's purpose. A goat may follow the sheep, but the goat eats garbage and lives that way. And sad to say today there are many who may call themselves church people who are living like goats, who have stayed away from the green pastures and are eating all the garbage that is being passed out. And what Jesus is saying is, he wants sheep and he's calling us. And you know, because he is God, he can do amazing things. He can even change sheep and make them new. And he can take goats and turn them into sheep. Because he is the almighty creator and through him all things were made. And in him we live and move and have our being. But more than that, not anything that has been made was made without him. He is before all things, and He is our God and our Savior, and He is good, and He's calling us to follow as a sheep, to simply go where the shepherd leads. may not be glamorous, but you know what? I don't know about you. Frankly, eating in a garbage dump does not sound terribly glamorous to me. <laughs> I just want to be a sheep. That's what my kids used to say. I just want to be a sheep. And that's what God is saying to us. He wants us to be sheep. Hardwired to follow him. Hardwired to go where the shepherd leads. And contrary to what I've been told over the years, when sheep follow the shepherd, they're capable of amazing things. Because they're not dumb animals. They just need a good shepherd. And that's who Jesus is. And what he offers to you and me is sheephood. And this is good. But it's also just an incredible testimony to his love. Because you see the good shepherd, the good shepherd became the lamb that was slain. And as the prophet Isaiah had predicted 700 years before the fact, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, he did not open his mouth. The shepherd became a lamb, and he willingly laid down his life for the sheep. One of the things I also learned about sheep is unlike goats, Sheep can take an awful lot of pain. In fact, sheep, before they get to the point where they are hurting so much that you know it, sheep will suffer silently for extended periods of time. God has made sheep, and he has wired them in a unique way to bear testimony to his children. And he calls us now to learn from them, even as Jesus said. He did not pull these analogies out of the air. He knows all things. And he said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. They follow me. And I give them eternal life. And no one will pluck them out of my hand. It's good to be a sheep, isn't it? And if, by the way, you've been hanging around with the goats for a little while, tonight's a good night to say I'm re-upping for sheep bit. <laughs> if you say, you know what, my diet has not been what it ought to be, and I'm not talking about how many carbs you have and how, many, uh, you know, how much protein or anything like that. I mean, what you're taking in, what you're consuming in your life, what you are filling your mind with. And what Jesus is saying to us is, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, put your mind on these things. Let him inform the mind and change the heart and renew the soul, because that's what he does. He is the good shepherd. He gives himself for his sheep. And he offers us 
life in Him. Tonight, we just say, I want to be a sheep. And by, by saying that, we say, I despair of trying to do things on my own. I'm going to stop the old excuses. I'm just going to listen to the shepherd. And I'm going to let him take over in my life. And he is good. And he does that. He's gracious. He doesn't impose himself on us. But he loves us dearly. And he wants us as his sheep. Bah. Bah. <laughs> It's a good sound. It's the sound of those who follow the shepherd. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, there are no secrets from you. Whether we've been hanging around with the goats or following a sheep, you know our hearts, you know the needs of our lives, and you know how desperately we need you. And so tonight, in your holy presence, we just pray, Lord Jesus, reign as the shepherd of my life. Amen. Take charge of me. Guide me. Protect me from those things that would take me away from you. Let me follow you with my whole heart. Let me know you as never before. Come down in power through your Holy Spirit that I may be transformed. By faith I say I reject goathood. Yes. And I desire to be your sheep and I desire to follow you. And by faith I know that you are good and gracious and you wipe away my guilt. You take away my sin. You restore my life. You renew my soul. And for that I praise your holy name. And I just desire to worship you forever. And I long to worship you anew until the day you return. And I say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the good shepherd. Praise be to you, O Lord, who laid down your life for the sheep and now fills your sheep with the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we say this, amen. Pastor Mark, I had wanted to talk to you about something, and I forgot in the midst of everything going on. Um, would, is communion acceptable today? It's a great thing. It is, and we just have to bring some. And uh, so I would invite you, if you would like to receive the Lord's Supper, you know, this is a great way to fill yourself up with stuff that's good. In the world, we have all sorts of garbage that's thrown our way. We see it in our entertainment. We see it all around us. It's in the news. It's online. It's around in our neighborhoods, our apartment buildings, our schools, our places of business. But God says he desires to feed our soul. One of the ways that he does that, a very powerful way, is to give us his body and blood to strengthen, uphold, and renew us. If you're one who believes in the Lord Jesus and been baptized in his name, he offers you and me spiritual food. And so tonight, we're going to uh, give you the opportunity to receive that spiritual food. It is a way that God nourishes our hearts by telling us, I love you so much. Jesus said the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He has given his life for you. When he celebrated the Lord's Supper with his disciples, it was all about sheep. Passover lamb has been slaughtered. The Bible says Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. The children of Israel were delivered from bondage because the blood of the lamb was smeared on the doorposts of their home. And if you look at Exodus chapter 12, where we read about that first Passover, you will notice God gave very specific instructions to them on how they were to do things. They were told to pour the blood of the lamb in the basin, is the way it's often translated. The Hebrew word is suf. 
It, it means a, a base and a trench at the foot of the door. To this day, in some parts of Egypt, you will still see those trenches outside the doors because Egypt is a dry land. It doesn't rain very often. When it does, it's often a flash flood. And by having that trench in front of the door, you keep the water from coming in right away. The Israelites were told to pour the blood of the sacrificial lamb in the trench, in the souf. And then they were to take a hyssop stalk, the very thing that would be used to offer Jesus wine mixed with myrrh when he was on the cross, and they were to dip that hyssop stalk in the blood in the soup. And then they were told to smear it on the cross beam and on the uprights of their doors. Do you notice the movement on the cross beam and on the uprights? They were actually making the sign of the cross. Now maybe that's a coincidence. And maybe Jesus just chose the, uh, the whole notion of sheep and goats out of the wind, right? God does not do anything by accident. And even then, 3,400 years ago, he was showing that it is through the blood of a lamb, a holy, precious, blameless lamb that God's people are delivered. And so on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. When he had broken it and given thanks, the bread from the Passover meal, unleavened bread, he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And after dinner, he took the cup of blessing, the third cup of the Passover. He held it up and he said, all of you drink of it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. As he did that, he's reminding us he is the lamb who was slain. And he's saying to us, sheep, I gave my life for you. And just as the children of Israel were delivered from bondage by the blood of the Lamb, you and I today are delivered from bondage to sin and death, decay, worthlessness, pain, sorrow, all sorts of addictions, all sorts of deep wounds, we are delivered through the blood of the Lamb. And so I would invite you tonight, if you would like to receive the Lord's Supper, let's all stand. We're going to take this meal together. I don't know if you've ever used anything like this before. This actually has grape juice in the bottom and a wafer on top. And uh, once you get the hang of it, it's fairly easy to use, but until you get the hang of it, it, it will cause all sorts of personal angst, okay? So I'd just like to free you from angst. I'm going to give a brief instruction here. And by the way, if you're a guy and you're kind of ham-fisted, uh, just, just turn to one of the ladies near you and say, could you help me open this? There is no shame in doing that, okay? But, but the way we're going to do this, you will notice there is a little cellophane cover on top of the wafer here. And if you take that clear cellophane and just simply pull it back, you will open up the covering and you should be able to grab the wafer. When you do that, would you mind holding that up? Any ham-fisted guys who needed any assistance here? Okay. Listen now to the word of the Lord. The Apostle Paul said, What I received from the Lord I also passed on to you. Our Lord Jesus, on the same night that he was betrayed, took bread. When he had broken it and given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, his followers, his sheep. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. My dear friends, let's take and eat the body of the Lord given for us. Now, if you would take the heavier tab and just pull it back, you should open up the cup and be able to access the grape juice, okay? And so here again, the word of Scripture. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. 
When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, All of you drink of it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Do you understand how personal that is? The Lord is saying, if you or I were the only people who had ever walked on the face of this planet, he still would have come down for us because he loves his children. And the good shepherd always lays down his life for the sheep. So take and drink. This is the blood of Jesus, the Messiah, given for us. And now may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and preserve you in the faith until that glorious day when he comes back. And we say, Amen. Come, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen.